Hi everybody, this is Dr. Kat Vlies with Video Q, and from this point forward, we're focusing on gas transport. Of course, the two gases that we will focus on are oxygen and carbon dioxide. So let's focus on oxygen first. First of all, remember, oxygen has a much lower solubility than carbon dioxide, and really only a percentage and a half or so is dissolved in our plasma. Most of the oxygen that makes it into our blood is very quickly going to end up binding to hemoglobin. Now something interesting happens when oxygen begins to bind. First of all, recall that each hemoglobin molecule can bind a maximum, maximum of four oxygen molecules. Well, what we see happening is that as more oxygen binds to hemoglobin, it becomes easier and easier for oxygen to bind. So we refer to that as the affinity for oxygen increases after the first oxygen binds. So we have this cooperativity, as it's sometimes called as well, meaning that as more and more oxygen binds, it's easier and easier for oxygen to bind. And similar principle for the unloading of oxygen. The first oxygen is hard to unload, but then the next oxygen molecules come off a lot easier. Remember your reaction two, which says that hemoglobin with a hydrogen attached to it is referred to as deoxyhemoglobin, will bind oxygen in the lungs, of course, to form oxyhemoglobin. And that results in the release of a hydrogen ion. In the tissues, on the other hand, the reaction occurs in the opposite direction because we are going to be unloading the oxygen. So in the lungs, we see oxygen loading of the blood, while in the tissues, we see oxygen unloading. meaning that the oxygen comes off the hemoglobin molecules. Again, a maximum of four molecules of oxygen can bind to hemoglobin. So when all four hemes have an oxygen attached to them, we say that we are dealing with a saturated hemoglobin, but we can also have partially saturated hemoglobin, where we just have uh, one, two, or three hemes occupied. On rare occasions, we might see an unsaturated hemoglobin with no oxygen bound. But because of that cooperativity between hemoglobin and oxygen, meaning that the fact, meaning that after the first molecule binds, it becomes easier and easier for more oxygen to bind, we do not see a linear relationship in the saturation of hemoglobin. Instead, we see a graph that expresses the lack of, of linearity, as I'll show you here in just a moment. So here we see a very carefully studied graph referred to as the oxygen hemoglobin saturation curve if you're looking at from the perspective of oxygen loading. Some people refer to it as the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve because we could also be talking about oxygen unloading. It all depends on how we are interpreting the graph as I'll show you here in just a moment. Right off the bat, notice that this is not a linear graph. If it were linear, it would be a straight line as such. So this more sigmoid curve implies or reflects the fact that oxygen loading and un unloading does not occur at the same pace for each oxygen that binds to a particular hemoglobin molecule. So let's analyze this graph. First of all, on the x-axis we see the partial pressure for oxygen and we see some pointers here 
the 40 refers to the oxygen levels in the tissues, while the 100 refers to the oxygen levels of the blood in the lungs. On the y-axis, on the other hand, we see the oxygen saturation levels of hemoglobin expressed in percentages, anywhere from 0 to 100%. When we are in the lungs and after oxygen loading of the blood has occurred, of course we would expect there to be 100% or close to 100% saturation for hemoglobin. On the other hand, in the tissues, we have a much lower partial pressure for oxygen because the blood, the hemoglobin in the blood, has unloaded the oxygen to provide the tissue cells with the oxygen. But notice, though, that the saturation level for hemoglobin in the blood that has visited the tissues is still pushing 75%. So, what this is telling us is that blood returning to the heart, our venous blood, still has quite a bit of oxygen in it. As a matter of fact, we refer to all of that oxygen that is still bound to hemoglobin in our veins as the venous reserve, meaning that we could possibly tap in to that oxygen bound to the hemoglobin in the blood of our veins. And we do, at times, when our tissues become metabolically very active, we may need to require more oxygen uh, for these tissues to where our partial pressure drops further, and that's no problem because we still have plenty of oxygen attached to hemoglobin. So there are two ways of looking at this graph. If we go in this direction, in other words, this red arrow, which is pointing towards our right, moving away from the zero point, we're oxygen loading. In other words, we're going, we're taking the blood from the tissues to the lungs eventually, and there the blood becomes provided with fresh oxygen. Or we can look at it in the opposite direction, which is often the easier way for me to interpret this graph, and that is we start at the lungs and move towards the tissues, and then we talk about the oxygen unloading. We have an additional y-axis on this graph over here, and this represents the amount of oxygen in millimeters per 100 mils of blood. Basically, how much oxygen is in a certain amount of blood, in 100 mils of blood. And notice that when we have pretty much 100% saturation in our arterial blood, we have a volume of 20 milliliters for oxygen. We express that as 20 volume percent. By the time oxygen unloading has finished in the tissues, again we have still 75% saturation of hemoglobin, and notice that we really only have unloaded about 5 milliliters of oxygen. So the blood that is going to end up in our venous system still has all of this amount of oxygen left, 15 mils. That explains, of course, too, that high percentage of oxygen sat uh, hemoglobin saturation. So only 5 millimeters of oxygen is released during the oxygen unloading process in the tissues. Now, we can breathe more deeply in an attempt to increase the partial pressure 
for oxygen in the body, in our blood to beyond 100, but we're already at almost a 100% saturation rate in the lungs when the partial pressure for oxygen is only at 100. So breathing more deeply and increasing the partial pressure for oxygen really does not impact our saturation levels for hemoglobin, by the way. Along those lines, let's come back to our graph and notice that our almost 100% saturation is already reached at about a partial pressure of 70 for oxygen. So we don't need to be anywhere near a partial pressure of 100 to have almost 100% saturation rate. We can get by just fine with a partial pressure of 70. Even when we go further down to a partial pressure of 60, we're still in pretty good shape. We're at about a 90% saturation rate. So beyond 70, these increases in the partial pressure of oxygen really are only going to lead to a minimal increase in the saturation for hemoglobin. So what are we really, what, what can we really deduce from this? Well, what we can deduce from this is that oxygen loading and unloading in the tissues is just fine even when our partial pressure of oxygen is below its normal levels. So in summary, since only about 5 milliliter of the 20 mils of oxygen present in 100 mils of blood is actually unloaded at rest, that graph we just studied is the graph at rest, I didn't stress that enough, that translates into only about 20 to 25 percent of bound oxygen being unloaded during one systemic circulation, right? Because five is about a quarter out of 20 mils. That's where we get this number or these, this range of numbers. Therefore, if the oxygen levels in the tissues drop, as I mentioned earlier, Let's say tissues are become, becoming very metabolically active. Let's say that you're working out hard and your skeletal muscles are using up a lot of oxygen. No problem, because more oxygen can easily dissociate from the hemoglobin because of our venous reserve. We have still plenty of oxygen bound to hemoglobin. And therefore, really, our respiratory rate or the cardiac output does not, or they neither one really necessarily have to increase. We really can depend on that venous reserve. Now, as a little side note, we've learned in the past about the venous reservoir, and now we're adding a new term, and that is we say we talk about the venous reserve. So what's the difference? The venous reserve refers to how much hemoglobin is still loaded with oxygen when the blood returns via our venous system to the heart at rest. V the, our venous reservoir refers to the fact like a, a uh, a reservoir of water, for instance, certain dams serve to collect water, and that is a reservoir of water. So a venous reservoir refers to the fact that our venous system holds about two-thirds of all of our blood. Notice that these two mean two very different things.